So our next speaker in um, transformative invention is Axel Scheer, California Institute of Technology. And his topic is from lab on a chip to chip in the body, the evolution of point of care health monitoring. Please join me in welcoming. Thank you. I'm uh, honored to be here in this fabulous company. Um, I'm going to share with you today sort of the hopes and the, the dreams of uh, what we've been working on in my group, which is uh, transitioning concepts uh, that we've had over the last 10, 20 years into clinical applications. And so the title sort of says lab on a chip. That's what we were thinking about 20 years ago, building systems that do things um, for clinical applications on a, on a chip. Uh, transitioning that into these kinds of devices which can be placed into the body. And I guess uh, this is my, the story of my life uh, in a nutshell is we've been working on shrinking things uh, for the last uh, 30 or so years. Um, I actually had the privilege of working with Harold Craighead, uh, who's, who was our first speaker this morning, um, initially at Bell Labs and Bellcore. And uh, I have to say I've been following him ever since. Uh, we've been trying to catch up with, with him. And he's been shrinking things and, and we've been following, okay? And the idea is Molecular sizes are about one nanometer, and we'd like to measure things at that scale. And not only do we want to measure things at that scale, but we also want to translate this into some application where we can uh, use this information uh, for some medical application. So the smallest structures we've made so, so far in my lab are about two nanometers in size. We've made them in silicon. We've made them in different materials. Turns out silicon, when you make it two nanometers wide, becomes a different material. It actually um, starts light, lighting up, it emits light, and it does all sorts of wonderful things I'm not going to talk about today. But the idea is we can shrink the device's structures down to very small sizes, and therefore we can start integrating these small things into systems that are of small sizes. And what we'd like to address is a problem that if we don't address, will bankrupt us all, which is the cost of healthcare. We have this continuous increase over the last 50 years of cost of healthcare to the point where it's now eight times more expensive um, for our country to deliver it. And at the same time, over the, the same 50 years, we've been observing this shrinking of structures, miniaturization. This is what we think about when we think about microchips as silicon revolution, if you will. And what my hope is, is that we can take advantage of this shrinking to address the bigger problem of cost. Um, so shrinking things uh, means making things in the smaller, on the smaller scale. Um, I think our, somebody was gonna push this button for me. Let me see if it works. Nope. Okay. Well, never mind. It turns out we can make microfluidic systems, and we've done that over the last years. Um, we can make them down to the sizes uh, of about 50 microns or so by miniaturization, by using the same kind of techniques that we used in the silicon industry, except on different materials. As Harold said, we use soft materials and things like that. Uh, we followed his footsteps. He did this about five years before we did. And uh, then we developed these capabilities of doing microfluidic systems where you have about 2,000 or so valves on a chip. And what you would do with the system is, for example, analyze individual cells. Uh, this is now uh, licensed by a company called Fluidime uh, up in the Bay Area. And this chip actually produces a RNA library of individual cells. Uh, there are 30 cells that are being taken apart and analyzed on this single chip. This would be called a lab on a chip. But if you really look at it, this is what you need to do to hook it up 
you have maybe 20 or so tubes that, can, that have to hook it up to the rest of the world. And if you look at it even from a bigger scale, you have this under a microscope with all these tubes hooked up. And it's really not capable of being put next to a patient bedside uh, to measure what their problems are. So it's difficult to change this technology um, to a clinical application. And so for the last couple of years, I've been trying to figure out how to change this concept of what I would call chip in a lab rather than lab on a chip to make it clinically relevant. Um, so we've gone away from miniaturization for a while. We built systems like this. These are little analysis systems. They're called PCR machines. They do polymerase chain reactions. And we've been shrinking those uh, to the point where now we can build them not only smaller but also cheaper. So instead of costing $50,000, an instrument like this now costs $500. Um, you can build it so that it can do all of the things that a laboratory technician would do for you, sample preparation, analysis, and all of that, and automate it so that you can have one like this in your bathroom, figuring out what kind of virus you have or what kind of bacterial infection you may have. And that's sort of an interesting byproduct of what we've been able to do. But what I really wanted to do is go down to the road of miniaturizing these kinds of things. And that gets us into the concept of what we're going to do for the next generation of healthcare, which eventually will be focused on predictive medicine rather than reactive medicine. If you can look at your baseline and see a change in it, then you can identify some problem very early on, and then you can talk to your doctor, and the doctor's information is now much more specific than looking at your temperature and taking your pulse. So we have this kind of predictive diagnostic systems in all sorts of forms, in jet engines, in cars, in phones, but we don't have them in ourselves. Okay. Some people do. Uh, diabetics have continuous glucose monitors at times. So there, we're slowly getting to the point where we can monitor ourselves and then make decisions based on it. So there's a hope, there's a, there's a road that if we can build the technology around it, we'd be able to do this kind of medicine. So what I'll talk about for the rest of this, this presentation is basically this concept. We have a little chip that is implanted in the body and it measures things. And in this case, we don't have a battery because we miniaturized to the point where a battery would be the biggest thing. So we're powering this like an RF tag. We simply power it from the outside. And the reason I'm putting this on a dime is because it's not just the smallest coin that I own, but it's because that's what this chip will cost. In silicon CMOS fabrication, one millimeter by one millimeter of silicon die costs 10 cents. And where it could be useful is for anybody that has to undergo this kind of treatment, measuring their blood glucose, we can avoid this and we can replace it with something that's embedded. It simply measures for us. It can be less expensive, it can have less tissue damage, you can actually measure things without perturbing the surrounding. And this is what these chips typically look like. They have a coil, which is essentially an antenna, that feeds the power into the chip as well as communicates with the rest of the world. It's like an RF tag, just smaller. And it has a circuit, about 10,000 transistors, that measure electrochemistry on this chip. 10,000 transistors may seem like a lot, but it's really not, compared to the kind of complexity that we have in our computers, in our processors, it's, it's really very, very traditional. What is um, unusual about this, this electronics is that it's a very, very low power electronics. So the entire chip only takes about two to five microwatts to power, so we can power it from the outside. And then <clears throat> we have a reader on the outside. This is our schematic, simply a reader that powers this thing like an RF reader. And you can make these chips on wafer scales. This is what for those of you who are electrical engineers, 
be fun to see because it's an RF, it's a oscilloscope trace. This is what happens when you send a tag signal in and it measures and then the chip sends back in a binary uh, modulated form the uh, current. So you see here there are wider and narrower peaks. The narrow peaks are zeros, the wide peaks are ones. And we, the chip sends out this back to the reader and that encodes the current that was just read on the working electrode off, in this case, off a gluco glucose monitor. You can measure then by looking at the binary signal you can measure the current and you can relate that to the concentration of glucose in the patient or in vitro and so on. This is the reader. It's sort of the size of a cell phone. Could be smaller. Right now we're just using whatever we can off the shelf. The concept is we have a 10 cent disposable, so we don't want to have a $10,000 reader, so we'd like to have it about a $100 reader, and that's what this is. This is our patient. My medical friends always laugh at me when I talk about rat patients because it seems like an oxymoron for them, but I, 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 I'm close to these rats because they're, they're really sort of cute. And here's a rat that's under anesthesia, so, and there's the reader and we're measuring the glucose. And here's the incision. It's a very small incision because the device is small. We can actually inject it if we wanted to. And this is what happens after a couple of days. You end up having it completely healed and you have very little scar tissue around the device. So it's measuring things that are representative of what's inside of the rat. And in fact, the reason why we have so little scar tissue is related to the size of our device. It turns out it doesn't rub against the tissue surrounding it. It actually doesn't irritate the cells surrounding it. And so therefore, we can actually take advantage of the fact that we are at a very small size, so we have a very small uh, scar tissue. And this is where the kind of readings that you get. If you measure the glucose, this is after three weeks in our rat patient, you see the we measure with a glucometer, and then we measure with our device continuously, and we can compare the two, and they actually match pretty well. This is all data that shows that it works. Well, where's the nanotechnology? Well, it turns out, in order to shrink this device even further, we're dealing with a fundamental problem, which is the size of our electrodes. We have to have an electrochemical cell. We're measuring on the working electrodes. We're measuring some, some current. And if we wanted to increase the sensitivity of our device, we can simply pattern the surface of the working electrode and increase that, um, that size by the surface area by a factor of a thousand or even more. And if you do that, you also see the signal increase by a factor comparable to the size. Now what we're doing is not only measuring glucose, we can measure many other things. Anything that generates an ion when it reacts with an enzyme can be measured. So you can measure lactate for your stress level. You can measure creatinine. You can measure all sorts of metabolites. And there's a list of ones that would be interesting to measure. And basically, we can go down this list and try them out, and that's what we've been doing. So it's a platform, really, that allows us to, to do, do things. We can also change our device. If you don't want to continuously measure, if you just want to take a spot check, you can take a needle and you take all the electronics outside of the body. And this needle could measure many things, in this case, 16 different things. Uh, you can make it the size of an acupuncture needle. Here's an acupuncture needle, there's a needle. So we know acupuncture it doesn't, isn't very painful because the needle's very sh small, so it doesn't uh, your nerves don't correlate that they've been injured. And we can make that things de devices even smaller by using things like, uh, for example, light powering. So if I take myself and power myself with a laser pointer, it turns out I'm pretty transparent. And if I go to a mid-infrared or, or near-infrared laser, I'm even more transparent. So we're basically using systems that, are like, that allow us to shrink these devices even further. Here's a device that's only 200 microns wide, and it uses these nanopattern electrodes. So there's a, a progression of shrinking devices. 
which are now around one millimeter in size. And we hope to get them down in smaller and smaller size so that they can fit into maybe the cardiovascular system, different places in the body where you might want to measure things. And we're following tradition. Miniaturization has a long tradition in microelectronics. We're simply jumping on that bandwagon. And the opportunity is that we could build devices that are measuring our health, okay? And we can do that in a way that is uh, capable to be sustained, not only in the Western world, where we have the money to pay for expensive infrastructure, but also in the developing world, where we need to have these devices as cheap as possible. Thank you very much.